Okay, well, thank you for coming on in person and Zoom to what I think is our first workshop Wednesday workshop. Sure. Is that correct? Okay, I'm looking at Mandy. Um, I'm Tara Bellings. I'm a scholarly communication librarian, and I'm going to be presenting about OER basics with Mandy Dubry, who is our uh, fine arts, literature, languages, and educational librarian, and Emily Davidson, who um, came up from the first floor and is instructional design associate from the Office of Digital Learning. So what we're going to do um, during this workshop is mostly talk about uh, OER basics, um, kind of like what OER is, why it's important, uh, why we encourage faculty to, to use and adopt OER, and some of the specific like nuts and bolts licensing that's required for material to be considered OER. And then Mandy's going to spend some time um, showing everyone how to find OER. Uh, in a couple of different uh, websites and databases that we have access to. And then Emily's going to spend some time talking about integrating OER into your Canvas courses. Okay, so first, um, what are OER? Uh, OER stands for Open Educational Resources. Um, they are uh, teaching and learning materials that are freely available for use reuse, adaptation, and sharing. So some OER do reside in the public domain and others will have specific licensing that allow for um, sharing, reproduction, uh, adapting, and distributing. Um, OER can include, traditionally they've included textbooks, but they can also include um, handouts, streaming videos, software, homework assignments, music, uh, music notation scores, um, lecture notes, online media, pretty much anything that you would use uh, in a course as supplemental uh, materials to your teaching. So the big question, uh, why are we talking about this and why should a person even use OER and why uh, is the library so obsessed with uh, people using OER? Um, the main concern is affordability for students. Um, the cost of higher education has uh, grown exponentially in the last 10 or 20 years, and the cost of textbooks has even outgrown that. So um, OER is a good um, option for faculty who are interested in providing free or affordable options to their students to cut down on the cost of tuition and, and courses and, and fees and things like that. Um, a survey conducted uh, by the US Public Interest Research Group found that uh, about seven in 10 students um, said that they didn't purchase a textbook at least once in one of their courses in college because the price was too high. Um, another study done by that same group in 2020 found similar results. Um, I think that initial one was done in 2011, but even you know, 10 years later, um, uh, an additional study found that about 66% of all surveyed students uh, skipped buying or renting course materials at some point in their college career because they simply could not afford uh, the cost of the materials for the course. Um, that 2020 survey also found uh, when asked, students were um, concerned that not purchasing the course materials would affect their overall grade in the course. And 90% of students said that they did believe that it would affect their, their grade. So they're having to uh, not only pay for tuition and fees and all the regular things that come along with um, enrolling in college, but also they have to consider whether or not they can afford to buy a textbook or not. 25% um, of students reported um, that they worked extra hours to pay for materials for their courses. And 11% said that in some cases they would skip meals or other things to be able to afford their college textbooks. Um, Faculty uh, who took this survey agree, 82% uh, said that textbooks and course materials cost too much. Um, and so from our perspective, um, OER is a solution uh, to that. You can still have course materials, textbooks, homework assignments, and things like that, but the students don't have the burden of having to have that additional cost for those materials. Um, OER enables students to access textbooks without worrying about the financial side, and they can have access to the materials right away because the majority of OER are online and electronic. And in fact, I should mention there was a report done by uh, Spark in 2018 that um, found that between the United States and Canada, uh, 
higher education institutions implementing OER, they saved a billion dollars to students. So it is impactful. And so when you look at the statistics of students saying they can't afford a textbook because it's too expensive, but then you see that there have been programs that have been really successful, it just makes sense that um, OER should be something that we're doing more of. Uh, additional reasons to use OER uh, from the perspective of a faculty member or a lecturer. Um, there's more freedom for instructors, instructors and for students. Uh, you can use, improve, and share OER. Um, thousands of OER already exist out there online. Betty is going to show uh, how to find some of those in a bit. Um, and you can easily access them and adapt them to your courses. You can tailor resources uh, to fit within the context of your course or your research. You can even have students help you. There are some faculty, I think, at UT Dallas who did a collaborative uh, writing of an OER, and he had his students contribute to the writing of the chapters. So there's a way to interact with your students in the creation of OER as well. Um, and as I said, uh, you can use OER resources to combine multiple different things. You don't have to stick with one particular textbook. So you have a little bit of flexibility in um, the different types of material you use as well, instead of just a traditional proprietary textbook. Um, but most importantly, it removes that price barrier for students. Um, and hopefully, um, because students can access it for free, uh, and immediately it will help with student success and retention, which is important. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into sort of the technical side of open educational resources. Um, for a learning or teaching material to be considered OER, uh, it must pass the five R's of OER. So um, all of these things must happen with, within the resource for it to be considered an OER. Um, you must be able to retain the material, so including managing and storing them on your own site, course management software, website, or blog, you should be able to take it and store it wherever you'd like. Um, you should be able to uh, reuse the content within the OER in a class, a study, for fun, in a video, in any medium you like, you should be able to take a section of the OER and reuse it however you'd like. Um, OER can be revised. So they can be changed, adapted uh, to fit differently within your course and educational style. They can be modified or translated. You can also remix OER uh, by combining it with other OER, uh, revising and adding your own content and relicensing it, um, all of that into a new fancier OER that fits particularly with your course. Um, and all OER must be able to be redistributed. So copies of the content have to be able to be shared with others in its original revised and remixed form. So if you're a faculty member and you create an OER, you need to, and you want other people to be able to adapt it and use it, you need to make sure you have a license that allows for that. Um, so these are the key concepts that sort of lie within the foundation of open education. Uh, and they basically exist um, so that sharing happens and we improve education and collaboration um, and more, most importantly, equity for education for students. So here are um, some Creative Commons licenses that I just wanted to go over real quick. Um, because OER require the five R's, uh, they are licensed differently than traditional textbooks through traditional publishers. Um, so OER, I would guess 99.9% .9 of OER have Creative Commons licenses, and these are copyright licenses. Um, so the green arrow here, any of the licenses that you see within this green arrow are OER licenses. So just real quickly, I'm going to go over what each of these mean. Uh, the buy, that's an attribution license. So if you see, um, and we can look at these when Vandy pulls up some um, examples, when you see a CC BY license, all that's asking for is that you do an attribution. All you have to do is cite where you got the word. Oh, I have some. Oh, someone's just sending something in the chat. Thank you, Kyle. Oh, that's okay. Um, so if it's in the public domain, you don't necessarily have to cite it. So that's this first one up here, but generally it's kind uh, to cite where you find your source. Um, this The SA license is a share alike license. That requires that if you take a bunch of OER and you create your own, 
that you share alike, meaning whatever license the OER that you took materials from, whatever license that one had, the one that you put out has to have the same license. So you might find something that says by SA, which means you have to, if you create your own OER, you have to cite and you have to use the same license. So you would also use the by SA Creative Commons license. Um, NC means non-commercial, which basically just means if you find an OER that has uh, any kind of Creative Commons NC license, you can reuse it, adapt it, redistribute, do all of the five R's, but you cannot then take your material and try to sell it for commercial use. It has to be shared non-commercially for free. Um, and then the last one combines sort of all three, the attribution, non-commercial, and share alike. You will find a lot of OER that have the buy and CSA license because that is sort of the, the most restrictive you can get with a Creative Commons license that still allows for OER. Um, so each of these sort of work in combination with each other, but they still provide um, the necessary license to allow for materials to be OER. Um, if you are in the market to create OER, um, it's your decision. Um, just make sure that you're using one of these licenses within the green arrows here. Um, and again, if you have, if you find things from Share Alike, make sure you use that Share Alike license. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Vandy and we can go into a little bit more detail. Are there any questions so far? When check. you say, quote, quote, use this license, what do you, what do you mean? practically? What do I, as the person with the material, do to quote, quote, use? If you're just using OER and you're not adapting and pulling and creating your own, if you're just using it in your course, then you just have to follow the buy, the buy license. So if you're teaching in the same way that you would for any proprietary textbook, just make, you, make sure you cite your source. If you're looking for OER, it's important to know that it needs to have one of these licenses or it's not OER. So if you're a faculty member and you're, you watch Vandy search in OER Commons and you're looking through things and you find something that has a CC by NCND, that's not OER. You can still use it, it might still be free, but it can't be adapted and redistributed. The ND is no derivative. So you can use it all you want, you can freely access it, but you're not gonna be able to around and mess with it, mix it up, rearrange it, whatever you feel like doing. Um, whatever license you choose, um, I'm happy to help if you are interested. Um, if you find OER or other materials that have Creative Commons licenses and you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm very familiar with these and I can help people not only decide like what license they want to use if they're creating materials, but I can also help you understand how you can use materials. Let me check the chat real quick. Oh, okay. Okay, here's Vandy. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Vandy Debris. I'm the Fine Arts, Literature, Languages, and Education Librarian. And I'm going to be taking you through a few of the ways that you can find OER edu educational resources. Um, a big thing to note is that OER resources aren't necessarily like library provided resources. And I get a lot of questions from faculty about that. Um, we can take uh, like an article that from a database that the library has and place it into a Canvas course, but that's not necessarily considered an OER. OERs are a, a different set uh, type of resource. So to make it as easy as we can for everybody. We actually have a guide on the library in the library's research guides on searching OERs. And that just takes me there. Okay, so I'm gonna go through it just like if you're doing it from home, you get to the library's webpage, however you get to it. Some people Google it, that's fine. Um, all you have to do is click research guides and then search up here OER. Okay. This is the guide right here. It's owned by Tara. So she can make send any changes. Yes, yeah, send all typos to Tara. 
but we're going to go into the finding and evaluating OERs. On this page, if you scroll down, you're going to see some of the same information that Tara was telling you. So you'll have more resources if you forget something or need information on it. But right now, we're going to go into the finding open educational resources. I want to highlight just a few of them. But if we look at the page, you've got access to a lot of different repositories for OERs. You've also got information on evaluating the OERs because that comes into play, especially you know with this term of OER, it's very it can be very open. So there are some criteria, some rubrics that will help you when you're evaluating them. And then again, we have the Creative Commons licenses. This was the image that Tara was showing you earlier. There's another one. It's a little bit more complex, confusing. Um, but this is always here for reference because sometimes as you're going through and digging through these things, it gets confusing what these little symbols mean. So I'm not trying to make anybody seasick, but um, I'm going to go in a little bit of a different order than what I had originally planned. So I'm going to start and we're going to go through Merlot. Then we're going to go into OER Commons. And then I'm going to show you how to search for these things in Google. We were having a conversation before this started about how some of these, the search functionality, actually, I don't want to do it that way. I'm going to open this in a new tab. And move this around. There we go. Okay. Some of these, the search functionality um, leaves us wanting a little bit more. I, I think, especially as librarians, uh, we are very attuned to searching and ways to do really good searches. So I, I can sometimes get a little frustrated with them. You've got your basic search here. You've got an advanced search. You can search by materials, ISBN. They do a whole thing with community members. And you can sign up with Merlot. It's a, a free thing. Uh, that means you can contribute and, and do reviews on things. I myself do not have an account with Merlot, but if that's something that you're interested in, you can do that. Um, if we click on advanced search by materials, you see it gets a little um, much, but we can go in and do some searching. I myself have had some chats with my art faculty and they're looking to maybe try and find um, an OER possibly for the art intro class because a lot of students take that class. They're not art majors. So it would be nice to be able to find one for that class. So that's what we're gonna be searching for. Um, However, it is a bit challenging to search for an art introduction textbook because using the word just, if we just use the word art, that's massively huge. Um, so I've actually been putting in the word introduction. And it's not necessarily the greatest search term to use because that can mean all kinds of things, but it's what we have to start. We can select a discipline here, obviously arts. And at least in this one, you can select multiple so that you can drill down. Some of them don't allow you to do that. You have to do one subject at a time, which can be quite, I don't know. To, to me, there's times when I need to do more than one subject, even though it's one class. I might find it in under a subject of medicine. If I'm looking, if I'm looking for a class that deals with uh, medicine as displayed in artwork. You've got language, which is important. If you're not looking for one in um, Scottish Gaelic, then take it out because these things are very, very large and worldwide. You've got all kinds of different things that you can look at. If what, the audience is gonna be a big one, um, I'm going to do both of these. And this is also something Merlot allows you to click multiple boxes in the advanced search. Others don't. You've got um, all kinds of different material types. And like Tara said, it's not just textbooks that are OER. So if you're looking for an entire course, 
they have those if you're looking for specifically a presentation or a quiz, they've got those as well. So you don't have to specify this, but if you know you're looking specifically for a certain type of thing, go for it because these are huge open repositories. You can select a specific date range. I'm not going to and hit search. Over here, like in most databases, you're going to have your disciplines. It tells you how many. You can jump through those. You've got your audience. If you decided, I'm really not liking some of these. I want upper division. You can select that. You've got other filters. And this is uh, pretty interesting. You've got ones where you can say, I only want to see the ones that are absolutely no cost. I only want to see ones that actually have editor reviews or user ratings. And that's a good way as you are going through these things and you're applying them to the rubric to see if you want to use it or not. That's something that you can look at and use. The um, has no cost is another large thing. As we have moved forward with OERs, Merlot, and, and when I, Tara and I were talking about this a minute ago, one of the drawbacks is that it's we don't exactly know how they vet the things that are coming in now. And so it seems like there's a lot more that's just being added and added and added without knowing what's the criteria for getting added to Merlot? Who's you know reviewing these things and that kind of stuff. So it can get very, very big. I've actually found some that I really don't think are truly OER in here. And it's like they, they link them. So you've got to go two or three pages deep to find that information. Um, let's find one that's a little bit more general. Let's look at this one, American painting in the 20th century. Okay, so if we look at this, this gives us a nice little record of it. We can see some of the table of contents, the disciplines, um, more information about it when it was written, who the authors are. So we have this one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So that's, that's putting it a little bit higher in my, uh, in my esteem there. And notice that, that mm -hmm. this one says open access textbook. Mm -hmm. So it's free, but it might not necessarily be an OER. So you would have to drill, if you were hoping to adapt mm -hmm. and not just use it in your class, you may right. have to look a little bit closer at the copyright license. It may just be mm -hmm. a free textbook, but not necessarily one you can change. Right. So a lot of times if you click this link, it will take you to others of that type. But yeah. And you can scroll down and browse from that point on. But we want to actually go to the material. And like I said, they, they link. They link to these things. They link out. So this is actually a Google ebook. And if you look over here, get the print book. Okay, so sometimes their, their links don't work as well as we would like to think that they do. So, yeah. Yeah, and you can see mm -hmm. if you scroll up just a little bit, you can see that it does have a copyright notice, mm -hmm. but it says copyright Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's available for free, so you could use it in your course, but you wouldn't be able to like take a chapter mm -hmm. from this to build onto another chapter mm -hmm. of an OER that you plan to adapted release. Right. And what we're seeing here is just the preview for the book. So it says there's no ebook available. So then we have to wonder what's going on here in Merlot to say that you can have this, that it's an open access textbook. How then do we get to the textbook? And that's one of the things that Tara and I were talking about is that they have it in here. They have it marked as an open access textbook. You know, it looks really good here, but then when we try to go to the material, it's not really. So. Yeah, and act your Nancy Drew. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and and it does take a little bit longer. And and again, you have uh, subject librarians who can help dig with this stuff. <laughs> Tara can help dig with it as well. She's really, really knowledgeable about this stuff. So. 
But at the end of the day, you're probably better off here than you are in Google. Yeah, uh, like, we're, we're going to get to yeah. that. Cool. Yeah, yeah, we're going to end with Google. Yeah, <laughs> from, from my part, we're going to end with Google. Okay, but you've also got things over here, but I mean, there's no links. So, and that's why using the rubric and vetting these things before you put them in your classroom is key. Um, especially, oh, so especially in, um, if you're using things like Merlot and stuff like that. I mean, I think with anything you do, but especially from this one. So if we went to this one and looked at it, we've got the table of contents. Again, it's an open access textbook. It's a website. Um, again, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Go to material. And again, it's coming out of Google Books. Same situation. But let's adjust our open access textbook. Okay. So now we're getting quite a little bit more. Um, this is an online course, as you can see here. This is an online course. Again, we're still getting the open access textbooks, but we're also getting assignments. We're getting e-portfolios. We we're getting uh, tutorials from the British Library, online courses from Yale, all kinds of things that are different. It, you could, depending on whether or not you know, the licensing that they have, like see this one says Creative Commons licensing. That's what we're looking for. So the work is licensed under attribution, non-commercial, share alike. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear that? Okay. okay. Tara said, yes, that's an OER. Okay, so, um, and then you can go to the material and look through it. Okay, you've got course materials you can download. Okay, so that's. Hmm? This, this one is uh, revisable one. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, good for Yale putting out a, a course that, that you are allowed to download. And yes, yes, for the materials for those on. Same thing. Yeah. Not, yes, yes, MIT does some. Yes, there's a, there's a lot out there that are verifiable. It's just you really got to dig into it and make sure that all of the stuff is there. So quick yes. Question. So I hear where it says more about this material. It says date modified. Is that something also look for? Is like when yes, it's, it's modified or edited in Merlot because it was first in twenty ten, uh -huh. but it looks mm -hmm. like a year ago. But like that's something to look for at least. It is possible mm -hmm. that the original author like made some revision to the site and then they uploaded the metadata on Merlot's site just so people knew like the original was in here, but then we uploaded a revised mm -hmm. version. Does that happen often in OERs? Uh, being revised, I think so, yeah. And more, con generally I would guess more content's being added to existing OER. Mm -hmm. um, because you might find someone, well, <laughs> you might find someone who's using an OER for their class, but it's missing like one chapter. So they'll edit and they'll add mm -hmm. one chapter and then they might re-upload and say, hey, here's the same one, but it's been revised because I've added like three sentences or something. Mm -hmm. But that that date modified in Merlot doesn't necessarily mean the text or the resource has been modified, but that's something about mm -hmm. the Merlot yeah. Yeah. Yes. Up the mm -hmm. record yes. or whatever has been modified. We added an mm -hmm. about page or yeah. Because remember, this is this is a record to the item itself. This isn't the item. Merlot is just kind of the repository where you can get links and and find these things. So yeah, it's, that's that's why one of the kind of issues I have is that we don't necessarily know the full links of the control that they have. Okay, so that's Merlot. We're gonna get out of that. I'm gonna clean some of this up. Okay. So the next one we're gonna go into is OER Commons. 
it looks a little different, functions a little different. You still have your advanced search. Um, you can enter in keywords. Uh, we're going to go into jazz history now. Again, language, English, subject area, arts and humanities, educational use. We can do different things with that. Material type. Again, you've got all kinds of different things that we can use here. Instructor materials, reading materials, let's say textbook or lecture notes. Um, again, education level is a big one. So I usually will set mine to community college lower division because that's usually freshman, sophomore level and then college upper division. I don't necessarily sometimes fully trust what they mean by those levels. So I wanna get both of them. Even if it's a freshman level class that you're looking for a textbook for, I, I would wanna see both. And other things, accessibility is another big thing. License types, unrestricted use. You can click as many of these as you want. You can drop it down. Creative Commons by public domain. Yeah, any of these three. Okay. Um, read the fine print. I'm, I'm loving that. And search. Okay. Again, you've got some limiters over here that you can move around with. Um, we've got some our licensings over here. And you can actually see them right away, right over here in your searches. Now I went with jazz history. That's pretty, a little narrow. Um, so I'm gonna click on this one. We see the description of the book, the author, the provider, uni. And we see the Creative Commons licenses right here. So we know it's how we can use it, if we can use it. And then we can click view the resource. And we've got the ability to download it. It's included in Music Commons. We've got abstract and a little bit of a visual of the item itself. So oh, that's a different, a different set. Between the two, I like um, OER Commons better than Merlot, but it is going to depend on what you're looking for and all of that. Another thing that we could look for is, let's say, political science. Let's do that in advanced search. Language, I'm going to set that to, again, English. Here's all the way to talk. It's not in the Ah, there it is. Okay, so political science, I've got that in there, but it is kind of a social science. I might even put arts and humanities, depending on where they put it, or history. Activities, do I want any of that? No, no, no. I want community college, upper division, search. Okay. So again, we've got our limiters over here. As you go through it and you decide, yes, I want that, or I need to add that some more, you can do that there. History all the different ones that they appear in. I can even drill down further and say, yeah, I just want it that way. Got my education levels, my material type. I can say, you know, I just, I just, I just want a lecture. I just want a textbook. Okay. 
and I can go through and look at them. If it's something I like, I've got my CC by attribution here. View the resource. Okay, and it's a book, so I can even download it. You good? Oh, <laughs> we've got a side conversations going on in here about publishing. But so that is OER Commons. Do we have any questions so far? Okay, so moving on. And Sarah, would you put the link to the handout that I have in um, the chat for everyone? I have a handout on using Google to search for OERs. Okay. And you can download it. It'll also be placed on the research guide that we have. And there are, you know, there are pro pros and cons to everything, but um, actually sometimes finding things through Google is a little bit easier. Um, and it will also find some things that could have possibly been in the OER Commons, but for whatever reason, the search in OE Commons, it got buried. So, um, but there's an interesting way you have to do this. So let's go back to our topic, art introduction. You have to do the search first. And then you have to go up here to this little settings gear. And then go down to advanced search. I mean, Tara yesterday Googled <laughs> advanced search, but sometime, you know, Google, where is your advanced search? You need to get to the advanced search in Google, and it seems like they've moved it. Oh, I Google. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. UT Tyler Library. Google advanced yeah. search. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. 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 Um, There's sometimes I just I just bookmark. I bookmark everything. <laughs> um, but it kept our search words here. Um, you can use an exact phrase if you want. We're not going to do that. Um, language, you can set language if you want. But what I really wanted to show you is the usage rights. This is where you get to that set. Instead of searching all of Google for everything that has the word art or the word introduction in it, you can drop that down and do your modifications here. Um, of course, the most open would be free to use, share, modify, even commercially. Mm -hmm. um, we can try that. Okay. Art explained, art history. Let's let's see what that is. I can't necessarily say it has to be a textbook, but this is something that I can use um, without having to worry about. I mean, it's an OER. So you can put this into your class, especially if you want to use different modalities, not just a textbook. If you want to use, um, and it depends on what you're teaching, you can use videos, stuff like, there's tons of things that are OER, not just textbooks, not just class lectures. Um, all of these things you can get into and place in and you have access to it. Um, let's see, get this one. Okay, this is AV film for education. And then this looks like a book. Okay. So credentialing, course credit. Gotcha. And welcome to Google search. Ah, there it is. Introduction to Art, Voices State. There we go. Okay. So, contents. We've got the entire contents here. You can scroll through it. Any questions so far on that? 
Of course, the more open you have those um, usage rights, the less you're going to get. Not filtered by license means it, there's nothing. Um, all licenses are available. You're going to get more. Um, you might want to stick with uh, free to use, share, or modify. Um, or even if you don't feel like modifying something, you could possibly use the free to use or share, but that's going to be a little bit. Oh, I agree that you found that search line I need to be. I would still check the individual oh, yes. licenses on, like especially mm -hmm. those first couple websites. Mm -hmm. I would if if you're looking primarily for OER in order to adapt or modify, and you find it through any of these, I would still look at the specific license on the actual item mm -hmm. just in case. Yeah, and that's that's in in anything with anything mm -hmm. um, because you know even even the people who may be like authoring mm -hmm. and entering it, they might not actually understand which Creative Commons license they chose or yes. what they're, you know, they might just stick a copyright license on there that they found mm -hmm. through Google, you mm -hmm. know, so. Yeah, or even um, there's been times when we found publishers that have something listed as an OER and then you go into it and it has a copyright restriction, like a, a full, mm -hmm. no sharing, no fully restricted copyright, but yet it's been listed and advertised as an OER. So that's one of the big things that you've really got to watch for. Any questions so far on this? I see a new chat. Oh, that was Sarah. Okay. So again, you've got the directions. Sarah has posted that handout in the chat. You ready, Emily? Yes. Okay. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Emily. And she is going to walk you through a few more things. All right. My name is Emily. I am an instructional design associate um, in the Office of Digital Learning. Um, and I'm just going to kind of show you a few different things you can do in Canvas to import um, this OER content into your Canvas courses. Um, and one thing too, um, I know this kind of goes with the search as well, but um, if you're familiar with searching in YouTube, you can actually look for Creative Commons tagged videos within YouTube as well. Um, it should, let me actually, I don't know what's going to come up here. <laughs> it's Sandy's logged in. <laughs> so when you go to search, let me move this bar here. Um, let's see, I believe it's here. Oh, actually, it's moved on me now. Yeah. This is the last time I used it. All right. So if we do say like a, yeah, no. right here. Mm -hmm. These filters, um, after you do your search, you can click this filters button and click Creative Commons here. I would um, definitely follow their advice for making sure if you're using this in your course to go in um, and just double check, um, sure. double check the, um, the copyright um, and see. So right here it says license, Creative Commons, uh, reuse is allowed, um, just to make sure that they don't put anything in their comments or video description along the lines of, oh, you might have to pay me or something you know, if you use this. Um, but usually um, YouTube's pretty good about uh, their filters. So uh, to keep that in mind that you can also do that with YouTube if you use a lot of videos in your course. Oh, I went ahead. All right. So for options in Canvas, um, these kind of go over what they've already talked about already. Um, Canvas Commons also has OpenStax um, integrated into it as well. So there's a lot of OpenStax um, OERs within the Canvas Commons, which I can show you. Um, you can integrate OER Commons. Of course, YouTube and Merlot, and then we also have the OER um, TX repository. 
um, which I'll show you here in just a moment. All right, so I'm going to pop over to Canvas real fast. So can every does everyone see? Are y'all seeing the Canvas course? I'm gonna make sure that I'm in the right spot. Okay. I'm just gonna double check and make sure. Okay. Sometimes it doesn't like to move over. <laughs> All right, so here is a Canvas course. Um, and what we can, there's a couple of different ways you can integrate it. So I'm gonna click on pages. Um, so if you create a new page in your course, say I want to uh, have my students, um, let's see, let's do, we'll do an English. So, it's pretty easy. Um, you'll be in the rich text editor, which is here. And this shows up in announcements, um, pages, assignments. So pretty much anywhere where there is the rich text editor, you can um, embed those OER contents. Um, you're gonna look for this little tab right here that you click on. It looks like a little plug next to the studio icon. And you wanna go to view all. So you're probably, you may not see all of these options here, um, when you do it, and I can show you how to fix that right after this. Um, but we have, so we have commons, um, we have Merlot, um, we have OER commons, um, and then we have the OER TX repository. Um, I find commons, uh, the OER commons works really well uh, with this. Merlot uh, is hit or miss. <laughs> um, so if you click here, supposedly you can, let's see if it'll work. Sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't. Um, yep. So <laughs> we have some issues with that, um, but let me go over here. Let me go back to OER Commons. Oh, of course, it's going to make me log in. So, <laughs> so that's one. That's one thing uh, with OER Commons. I forgot when I did this on my computer. I was already logged into it. Um, so let me see. Actually, let me see if I can log into it real quick. I apologize. And I'm sure I won't be able to remember my password the first time. Okay. All right. Well, that's not going to, to work. So, okay. Well, maybe I can log in and show you at the end here, but give me just a second. Um, it's going to look exactly the same as the website. Um, if you click on the OER Commons, um, so if you went to the OER Commons website, it's going to look just like that. You can do the searches. Um, and what it does is it brings that page into your Canvas course. Now, I believe, let me look here. I might have had an OER test page that I've done already. Oh, was it at the top? There we go. Let me see here. Maybe I saved it. Okay. So this is what it would look like once it starts to load, if it wants to load. And yeah, I might have to log in in order for it to show. But um, like I said, it'll it pretty much just brings the website into Canvas, um, and it's very easy. Um, I wish I could show it to you, and I really apologize. <laughs> um, but if you have any um, questions um, about that, you can always reach out to the Office of Digital Learning um, or the library, and they can direct you to us, um, and we can kind of sit down and go through that with y'all. Um, how to, what it will look like um, in setting up an account. But if you don't see these options here, yeah, yeah, I'll go, I'll show that them, to them here in just a second. Um, if you don't see these options, I just kind of want to show you how to get those really quickly. So you're going to want to go into your course settings down here at the bottom. And then you're going to want to go to apps. And so if you say, if you do want Merlot, you would type in Merlot. Um, and since I already have it installed, you would just click add app. So I'm not gonna go through that because I already have it, but um, it, that will add it to that drop down menu that you saw earlier. Um, same with OER Commons. Um, it'll pop up once you start typing it, and then you'll just add app 
um, and then you'll go back to your pages um, or your assignments wherever you need um, and you can add them from there. Can I ask, is the main benefit of this that you can view in browser within Canvas the book or the text or the right. as opposed to just a direct link out posted as a right. link up here? Exactly. Okay. So um, yeah, if I yeah, so you don't have to have your students go out um, to, to a tool website and find the link. They can stay within the course. Um, let me go here. Hey Emily, um, while you're doing that, um, if questions come up in, in the room, could y'all make sure to repeat them so we can hear them on Zoom? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes. No, that's okay. And, <laughs> and also when you get a moment, like not rushing you, um, because I know you're in this process of doing this, but we do have a question on chat. Um, the students won't need an OER login, right? Just the instructor. Um, that I'll have to double check. I'm pretty sure they they shouldn't need to have um a an account at least for OER Commons. Um, that might have just been the way that I had added it. Um, but let me I'll double check um on that for you. Uh, but the question before was um what was so what is the purpose I guess of of doing it within Canvas? Is it just so students can don't have to click out of a website? Um, which yes, that's the case. Um, it's kind of just houses everything into Canvas for you. Um, so that way your students don't have to leave Canvas um, as much or at all. Um, so that was the question that was um, asked just a second ago. Thank so you this so is, much. Oh yeah. Um, this is the OER TX repository. Um, I don't think it's not as big as say Merlot or the Commons. Uh, but it definitely has some great stuff on here as well. Um, and you can go ahead and look through here. Um, let's see, I'll click on a business. I'm kind of just going through this quickly so I can show you how to how to um, how to use it. Okay. And then it has the licenses down here. And for OERTX, it should. Of course, nothing's going right today for me, but <laughs> sometimes these plugins can get a little um, finicky. Um, so I like to stay with OER Commons um, mostly when I use it. Um, of course, now nothing I click on is working. Um, let's see, let's try a different one here. Okay, so this actually does have some resources available. It looks like this one's housed in OER Commons as well. Um, <clears throat> which of course now it's gonna make me log in. So <laughs> there's there's um there's a couple of, of workarounds sometimes you have to do with, with these plugins. Um, but once you have an OER Commons login, it's really easy to use. Um, let me oh okay. So I'm sorry that like apparently none of these um, I can I can show you fully um, due to the login issue. Um, but that's how that's how you would really um, embed them to into any course um, through Canvas. Um, usually the OER com uh, or sorry the OER web pages will have an embed option um, which you can also use um, in Canvas. Um, you would just insert and embed it gives you an embed code so it's really you can put it in a few different ways um all right let me see here oh and one more thing i knew i was reading something there is commons here available to you as well um so anyone that has um canvas has access to this um but pretty much anyone can upload to this as well so you can um, search for, let's see, let's do English. So there's courses, um, assignments. You might already be familiar with Canvas Commons um, and you can filter here as well. I usually like to do what Fanny did and do undergraduate and graduate. Um, and you can also, for if you need to, um, filter uh, where, where the content comes from as well. Um, so if I do say like this English 101 here, you can see where the, um, this is public domain. 
If you click on that, it'll take you right to the Creative Commons website and it kind of explains that, um, that copyright um, for you. It goes a little bit more in depth. Um, so you know exactly you know, what you're getting or what you can use it for. And then these are really easy to um, put into your course. Once you find something you like, just import or download. Um, and you're gonna see, I have a lot more uh, courses than a lot of people do, but um, you just click your course and then import. So I guess I could just go through that. Uh, you might not wanna click all, <laughs> um, but you select your courses and you can import into the course. So it definitely makes it really easy, um, really easy to bring stuff in that way. And I think that was it for um, kind of showing you. Um, there was, let me get back to the PowerPoint here. And then these are just some, some tips kind of um, to keep in mind uh, when you're using OER in your um, class. Um, <clears throat> So things like um, if you're doing an OER textbook, um, it's good to uh, get with the uh, a quote from the university printing. So that way you can have your students, do you want to print out the book? Um, they can uh, have that, how much they're going to spend uh, prior to doing it. So they don't go to, uh, to the printing um, office and, oh, this is going to be you know, just as much to print this out as buying the book is or something like that. So it's good to know uh, how much, um, the printing might cost if they do, if you are using an OER textbook. Um, and then these aren't really OER specific, um, but if you are using um, lectures and videos and things like that, um, see if they come with transcripts or slides, maybe that uh, that can accompany them for their students as well. Um, so that's always something to, to look for. And I believe that might be it. I'm sorry, again, for not being able to show you completely um, how to integrate those, but it is all done through the um, embed tool in the little um, rich text editor. So um, you're always welcome to get with us um, in the Office of Digital Learning, and we can definitely step by step feed through that. Um, and that will I'll be logged in and you can actually see. <laughs> Thank you. OK, do we have any? Additional questions from anybody in person? Do you know of any faculty constructing OER currently on campus? Okay, so the question is, do I know of any faculty currently construct constructing OER on campus? Um, no, I will mention, I know we only have a couple minutes. Um, there is a um, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board grant right now for faculty who either want to develop OER, so construct and make, um, and implementation grants if you want to find uh, an OER and implement it for your course. The main issue with that is that the deadline to turn in the grant is February 10th. So if you are interested, it is a short timeline, but we can help you find materials or help you figure out um, like ROI or uh, make an argument for adopting OER if you want to do an implementation grant. As far as people who are currently on campus writing OER, um, Kyle Gullings is sort of still editing an almost fully written OER for his music theory courses with some other faculty. Um, we've also had political science faculty on campus write mm -hmm. uh, OER for their courses, and um, I've gotten a little bit of uh, interest in some faculty who want to apply for this coordinating board grant who want to develop. So we'll see what happens. But I would guess, based on what I know over the years, maybe like a half a dozen have written OER, uh, a lot more have adopted. A little bit easier to adopt than it is to write a whole, a whole textbook. So. Okay, well, thank you guys for attending. And if you have questions, please reach out to me or your Please on librarian or anyone at the Office of Digital Learning, and we are happy to help you. Thank you. Yeah.